Good afternoon and a very warm welcome everyone to this session put on by Survey and Spatial New Zealand on the subject of the role of the Engineering Surveyor Manager. My name is Jane Alberston. I'm facilitating this session today. Some of you know me. I work in professional development at Survey and Spatial, namely on the new certification framework and the programs underneath it. And it is my great pleasure to welcome our presenter today, Craig Canale from Fulton Hogan. Some of you may know a Craig and I'm really appreciative, or we are really appreciative of you, a Craig coming to deliver this uh, to us today. If you have read the bio before you registered, you'll know that Craig is an exceptionally experienced um, surveyor. He was a licensed surveyor for many, many, many years. I understand he's um, put through well over 100 data sets himself, so um, very experienced and has worked uh, in engineering surveying for a ton of years on some of the most iconic projects around New Zealand and also on others uh, offshore. So it's really, really great to have you, Craig. Just an, another thing, um, we are also exceptionally excited to be welcoming Craig to our engineering survey assessor team for the new certification, the Certified Professional Engineering Surveyor. Craig recently put forward his application, was assessed, of course, highly successful, and we've invited him to come on to the assessor team. So that's just uh, another accolade um, that Craig has. So we're really looking forward to this session. This is usually a lecture that Craig delivers to University of Otago students as part of the BSERV. Craig can tell you more about that. And we just thought this was, was uh, an exceptional opportunity to have this as part of our CPD calendar uh, to provide the recording and also um, possibly to get Craig involved in other CPD moving forward. So I'm going to hand it over to you now, Craig. Just for everyone listening in, if you are joining, um, if you can have your, your sound off, that would be great. And that's fine if you have your cameras off. And I just want to say that we will allow some room, some time in this session for a couple of questions. So I've said to Craig if he can keep his presentation to around about 45 minutes and then we'll have a good 15 minutes or so to take some questions from the floor for Craig. So take a note as he's going through of anything uh, that you would like to ask or any notes that you've come along with. Uh, this will be a really great interactive session um, at the end. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you, Craig. Thank you. Jane, first I'd like to thank the amazing journey I've been through and hope in becoming a certified special engineering surveyor it was really worthwhile. A lot of work, but I can really see it helped us at Felton Hogan with our systems. It was just an amazing journey. And yeah, I really appreciate you guys putting that on for us. Right, so guys, this is a lecture I I did for the Target University fourth year engineering students. It's the role of an engineering survey manager. I presented this about three weeks ago. I have changed some items in this just to make it a little bit more, not student based, but a real world. So just first of all, we just, I'll just start off. Just thought we just got this nice little picture here. And on one of our projects, we actually had one of our instruments blow over on this project. So we come up with some ideas, like put some sandbags. And the best idea for one of the guys was put a waratah down the middle. And if it's really windy, duct tape, that'll never blow over in the wind. Right, so first of all, I'm gonna go over the roles. So I'm gonna start off with the typical roles on an engineering project. So they are, you verify the benchmarks, you verify the client, digital train model, you'd set up your GPS, you do some QA on the data sets um, supplied, you calculate some initial quantities, you establish some control, you create some machine control files, you manage the field set out, you do some quality QA reporting, and you do the final volumes, then you manage as-built requirements, and then you Throughout the project, you manage safety. So the first thing is the B benchmark verification. So normally the client will supply you a set of benchmarks used to do the initial design on the project. First, what you must determine is what is the accuracy requirements for your project. 
Now that could be five millimeters or a couple of millimeters if you're putting a structure in, or it could be 50, 60 millimeters if you're doing an earthworks job. You must then determine the datum. Might be on a local datum, but more than often it will be on a, on a recognized datum in New Zealand. So for the sample, North Tyree 2000, New Zealand vertical datum 2016. One must be very careful with height datums as the Otago datum and the New Zealand vertical datum are different by around about 0.38 of a metre. And I've seen countless times where this has been an issue on our projects. Right, so the first thing I normally do is just go through and do a single point GPS verification. Now I just go through and check, initially check that my benchmarks are all okay and there's no real, nothing that's too out of the way. If, if it's a really accurate project, I'll go through the benchmarks and then I will um, just do, run a level run through it. And then I'll do some resections between survey marks using a total station. Now, if you have any issues or they don't meet the criteria for your checks, you must talk to the client and get some um, clarity on that. Right, so on one project, it was a very tricky little project that was for a major redevelopment with some rail in Dunedin and we had some tracks on top of the rail and we had some infrastructure where they were gonna be putting some wagons in. So we had to get a very accurate, accurate sort of benchmarks. So they asked me to go and verify these marks. So what I was only two marks that were existing on the site from all the site works. So I went on site, I set myself up two static um, GPS vectors into these marks, verified these marks, wrote a report, did a level run from an adjacent survey mark, did a least squares resection adjustment just to check the marks were all good. And then I actually got some residuals of two mils, one mil and zero, proving that their mark or their marks they gave us were consistent with what my client at the time was on a different project, but these were interconnected. So that's very important to write these reports just about on every job you do. GPS setup. Now, one of the first things you do is on a major job, you might have four or five GPS units or 10, see how you're gonna get the corrections out. So what you would do, what we do is we look at whether make a decision on, do we require a radio or internet? Do we want a single point or a site calibration? Now, there's a big difference between a single point and a site calibration. If you do a site calibration, you're normally restrained to around a five kilometer by five kilometer square. And it will, if you set up on, you need three marks, but if you say use five marks, it will add rotation, scale factor, and we'll put an inclined plane. So you're not actually on a datum. We prefer to use a single point calibration, use a geoid model. So we'll verify that by running through, this is a run through of all the, once we'd set it up on a single point, we go through and we check that the geoid model is working okay and the X, Y. You'll then need to sort out whether you're going to use a radio or this N-trip. So quite often a lot now, the N-trip through, through the internet based is quite a good way of doing it. I just set one up yesterday where it actually went on site, set up the, set up the base. It actually went to a server in China and then went straight out to four or five of our diggers. So that was really, really good option. Or you might use a local, you might use a local lens or a local one of the suppliers have got good networks. The other thing you might consider is that when you're using an, a network sort of type adjustment, which will bring down your accuracies. Now, what, what we think at Felton Hogan is a really good idea is to actually set up some lens marks prior to a major project. And this actually giving a bit back because over the years contractors have taken out a lot of a lot of survey marks. And it also means that your survey is on a datum, approved datum. So it's very easy to set up a fifth order or a fourth order lens lens mark. The criteria is not that hard to meet that. 
Right. DTM verifications. We've, we've got the benchmarks all sorted. We're, we're inside the accuracy. What we want now, your client will supply you with an existing, and then there's our design. This is a cross section through a road. This is very important for volumes. I've got here, like we can use a car mounted GPS to check some of the edges. Now, what you need to do is you need to work out what are your high value zones. Now, what do I mean by that? So what I mean by that is that most of the construction will be carried out between these red lines. And then outside of here, limited construction. So it's very important. So I want to verify this terrain model I need for this project plus or minus five mils accuracy for my volumes and my tie-in points. So I would use a total station or a scanner for that. And on the outlaying ones, I may use a GPS or drone just to verify that. Discuss with the client if you have any variations between the natural or the surface they give you and yours that will affect the volumes. Produce reports. Now, don't get clever and say when it suits you, if we're high and we're low, we'll only tell them when, it's, when it suits us. No, I've always come clean. I just say, hey, the DTM is different to my, to, my, to my checks in this area. And normally, you'll get together with the consultant surveyor or the consult the client, and you will work together and work out what get the right model. Right, verify client data. This was during my assessment. It was generally um, agreed that sometimes the client data supplied can be varied and di different standard. So you've got to, at the start of the project, request what you want. So it's so what we do is the standard we would request the datums are on, the benchmarks used the natural surface, the design surface, DTMs, and any relevant strings and points in a 3D format. Right, so then what we would do with that data is we would produce our own alignments and DTMs. Now, one of the problems is, so what, This I did this over one COVID a couple of years ago, I got the data off the client and I went through, and so I went through all the data, and looked at looked at were they relevant? What what were the points? Was the was it on the design model? Did I need that as part of the design? Now we you may not need as part of the design. There may be a wall in the design, or some wheel stops, or something like that. That is, um, you don't normally put in the design, so you'll put some notes on what's what's required. One must be very careful that because they say it is a it's a it's a, it's a lip of curb, it actually might be the top of curb, which has happened to us. So you must be very careful on looking at the names. What they say is what they may not always be right. So you can't misinterpret the data. That's what this initial 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 what I initial what I'm looking at. Issue a note to engineer with any errors, the sort of errors you might get, overlapping lines. I had one occasion where I got some data that was about 100 meters long and one meter sections, and it was 100 meters or so, and it had one height point of zero at the back over a one meter section. So that that's we're doing long sections. Client will issue multiple data sets during the project. On this project here, though I looked at the data, there were something like 20 data sets. You had to be very good at managing the data. So some of the tools you can use to manage it is, you can use this to turn on and off the correct strings for your model. You can run a new model, and then you can do a heat map of saying the height differences between the old and the new model. And that's quite a good way of looking what what has changed or varied on the project. What they can do, they might put a revision cloud around a section, but they've actually changed other sections. So you've got to know what they've changed. Make sure you're on the correct version of data. 
Now at Thilton Home, I'm very lucky that we have some very good document control systems. So this is just a couple of them. One of them here is every time we get a model, we will fill out a spreadsheet and that spreadsheet will have just the standard data on that. And then we'll superimpose that spreadsheet onto, onto the CAD drawing. And that we won't use it unless it's been verified like that. And we have our typical survey registers or engineering registers of what drawings we got, what files we've got, hyperlinker location, what date they were, what rev they were. Very important, very important that you that you do that. Sometimes on our document control, I've been on projects where they've had five paper copies, PDFs, and they're a controlled document, and they will um, sign. So every time they change a version, they will go out there and some it will be a signed version. There's only five versions out there. It's not like you just don't go and print off the latest um, or latest and greatest because that's bad news because you can actually have old versions out there. So there's only five or four controlled documents out there. Right, quantities. Right, this is four. You will have a schedule of quantities off the client. It's very important that you go through and you verify that they are in the ballpark or they are close because that is what your contract can be the payment purpose of your contract. And everyone's better to know if there are any issues. I did one recently and the volumes were out by double. Massive ramifications, right? So you're checking, you've, you'll be checking volumes. You'll be checking, say, areas, it might be garden areas or areas of, se of seal. You'll be checking strings, that might be curb strings, timber edge, retaining walls, string lengths. So they're all part of the schedule. Right, so what we come up with quite a clever way when I was working in Australia on some projects of how to calculate volumes in quite a clever, clever way and, and make it really easy. So what we did was we went through and we calculated this is a, a cross section through a project we did. And here's some cut to waste and just a couple of components of it. And here's some rock fill. So we're just really concentrating on this rock fill now. So for every 10 meters along the project, we calculated how much fill there'd be. So for this section, there was 129 cube. For this here, there was 122 cube. Now, everyone, so that made it really easy to do your volume. So actually at the end of the month, you didn't really, you, you, you did survey it, but the engineer could walk out there and go, yeah, I've finished section 240, 250. I can claim that amount. But we're only halfway through that section, say from 260 to 280. I'll just claim half of that. It looks like half and we'll make it up next month. So it's a really good way of actually, and when you're actually putting it in, you actually know where you are. And if things start to creep, you've got a really good chance to um, pick it up. Right, so establish, you've got to establish some control. So quite often on a project, old control can be destroyed. Where possible, we try and use targets like this. So this here, and we come up with quite a nice way of naming it, particularly on a road and a rail corridor. What we did was we actually used, there's a, program out there called mobile roads an app on your phone and it'll give you the change of what road you're on the running distance so if you put that on here you can see that we've got a six six uh, two six one ten we've got a name so we've got targets on either side so anyone with a mobile phone can grab the control sheet and it's really easy to find these marks on a rail corridor and on in the corridor in the corridor in New Zealand now the reason we like Reflectorless targets is, is because it only takes five minutes to set up on three good marks or, and you get a really good resection in your mobile and you can move up and down, up and down on the alignment or the job you're on. Right, so you must maintain a register of control marks. So this is just a very basic one, but normally you'd have watch marks being destroyed, what the latest values are. Yeah, it's, it's the survey manager's role keep very good stock of that. So if you're putting new control in, you will need to 
have some QA documentation. So I looked at a point there called PMM2. So what I've done to establish that point is I've had two static vectors I've brought in. These are the accuracies and I've got a mean value here. So that is my QA. And over here, I've just done a gross error check with my, my RTK on the site and I've come up with a nine. So I know I haven't made an error. When you're processing this, and whatever software you're using, you can maybe pick the wrong geoid model, get it wrong. So that is my documentation and that is my proof. Another good idea, I keep saying this, is set up a lens benchmark as part of your control. So if you set up three or four of them during your project, you know your as-built are on the right datum and you're also doing something good for the community because you're putting back and you're putting some marks in there. That's a great philosophy that our company is to put back. Right, machine control files. Right, so you will have to grab, you have to make a di digital train model of what you are trying to instruct. That is when I come in before and said, hey, some of these items like fences and wheel stops and say the bottom of a batter may not, you may just want the actual between curb and curb and that's what your machine control is working you must use really excellent QA tools to prove that your model is correct. Some of these tools will be, this one here is a little drive through with your project. You may look at your contour. You may look at the watershed. You may do some vertical exaggeration. You might put it five times and see if there's any errors. You'll look at um, a heat map of, and our software will give us heat maps of all the grades. So you must really QA that. Sometimes you may even have to change the design model because your equipment will not be able to construct that. So if you're doing that, you need to go back to the designer and saying, hey, our paver can only lay in three meter sections. This is too aggressive, the geometry. Can we please work together and get a, get a system that we can work it on? So when you're doing machine control, so you've got to load it into the machines, load the latest version. There's plenty of systems out there. You can do it over the internet or you can just have your engineers or yourself going out and loading it. You'll need to bench your machines. You'll need to set up a whole lot of benching marks and points on your project. Quite often these may be a railway sleeper where they'll go and put their blade or their bucket on it. And quite often what I do on a project is I'll actually set up maybe five or six waratahs, whatever. But on those waratahs, I'll actually put all the surfaces like the top of, so it's a road, the top of the road, the top of the, the top of the AP40, the top of the AP65 and the subgrade. So that means what you're actually doing is actually checking the model as you're working. So out your digger can go, look, I'm, I'm doing subgrade, put his digger, bucket up against that, yeah, I've got my, I've got all my offsets right. Don't be afraid to do field checks. Quite often, it's really good practice just to go out there and maybe spray across and then just put on it what it is, what it is cutting to the surface they're working to. It's really important that you also, don't be afraid just to walk up to the digger or the grader and then just put your, put your total, it's better if you've got a total station because it's more accurate if you've got your GPS just to check everything aligns. Now, when I was working in Australia a few years ago, some consultant, we had one base set up over a mark, moved the base by about half a metre to set his piece of equipment up. The problem was we had, it was at lunchtime when they did it, and we had maybe, we had, 20 pieces of plant working off the space and it just caused havoc. It did take a wee while. The height wasn't too different. The XY was about well, maybe a metre. It was still operating, so we didn't know. But that's why if you're doing all your checks, yeah, it was quite an interesting conversation um, with that gentleman in a public house at, the, at, at that night. So, yeah, you just – so probably lessons I learned from that was just – don't set up over the mark if you don't have just just take every, take it all out of your out of your control. Now, if we'd had yeah, so just be very careful of that. Right now, this is another one. You've got to manage your set out. So this is quite this is see, quite a big aspect of it. So what you have to do is set up all your data sets. So an example of this data set here is a 
curb and channel set out details. So we've got the project, what lip it is, it's lip two, who it is, who's whatever, all the detail. So what you will need to do is you can't just set out curb and channel without knowing where all the vertical and horizontal tangent points are. So we actually know where all those are. So we go through and run a long section through the work, prove where those are, and then we go and set those out. So you need to provide your, your field staff with that info as well. So they need to know where all the vertical and horizontal. And then we, part of our business, we do a risk matrix assessment on anything over $50,000 you need to compile or set out register. Now, one project I worked on in Australia, every peg had a unique number on it. So on the back of it, it would have a, a unique number. So, and it had a database rule that was, so someone could go and look up that origin of that peg and see the QA. So you need to liaise all this information here with, with and this is standard for us, our engineers would get that sort of information. Right, so when I'm talking about risk, assessment um so how do we risk assess what we're out there doing so i've said we're out there doing a hundred thousand dollar project if you look over here now we've gone through all what and and incorrect string now if you get if you if you're trying we'll, we'll keep going on the curb if you're trying to go lip a curb or top a curb that's gonna be a bad hair day that's really going to do some and we've estimated that's fifty thousand dollars so incorrect datum. So if you're using a GPS and it's on the incorrect datum, could cost you that amount of money. Um, if you don't confirm your tie-ins, so you may be tying in at each end of a road, but there's 50 or 60 or 100 mil difference, that's going to cause an error. But all those things should be checked. Then we go down some of the minor ones, like we haven't put the right temperature and pressure into our total station, not a big deal. It all depends what you're working on. Your calibrations out of the three months, out of your three month time period. You haven't read multiple faces. You've um, your bubbles slightly out. All these things here are part of your risk control matrix. So if you set all these up right and go through it, you can control the risk of setting out on that project. Another thing is your yeah, QA reporting. You can do some heat maps just of whether it's in spec, out of spec. You can do your reporting. So that might be a, how far below or above a DTM you are. It may be an alignment string that you've, you've checked. Risk control plan, I've just gone over that. And don't be afraid to go out there and just do some audit surveys of what's been of what's being set out, say prior to a, a poor, just go out there and do an audit survey. Very important. Right, so this here is a typical ITP that we would set up for setting out a structure. So on here, our guys would come in at the end of the day and they'll fill this out. So what they'll put in here, where the data come from, who the instruction come from, where the data was stored. So you've always got to, you know, we're, so the alignment's been created, the initial resection you've done, that's all been, it's within spec, determine relevant horizontal vertical. So that's what the engineer said he requires. Stakes, right, right, a cut, fill on, on details on the pegs. You ask what's required. We'll check 50% with reflectless. Instead of using the pole to make sure we haven't got an error there, we'll show the close and all of our QA reports will be reported. Right, so this here is part of that sort of QA. So quite often, this is uh, probably the structure here might have been worth $250,000. So we have got every peg we set out on the project, we took a photograph of, we wrote the correct information on it and we cross-checked it. So we've set it off one meter off the face of a wall and we're zero above. So that height's there. And that's just another nominal offset up to the top. So every peg on every chainage was set up like that. Now it's hard to see on here for me, but this here is an alignment through there. So we've proved all of the all of the points. And then here is our resection we used. And down here is our QA set out report. So it's telling us what we, how far off we were and what our height difference was. The main criteria for this project was height. We needed the height under three or four mils. This here, 
we got, I think that was 10 mils, plus or minus 10 mils. So we see we've met all of the criteria. It's very important when you come in at the end of a job or, or sit out that you at least grab a sit out report and you do it. Right, final quantities. Right, so the final quantities will be different from the actual, um, from the schedule. The reason is that when you've got a schedule, you will um, be, that's the road, you're constructing a road, your final surface on the road may be allowed to be 10 millimetres high according to the specifications. So if it's 10 millimetres high and you're only putting in, say, 100 millimetres of AP40, you're out by 10% already. So you've got to be just aware. And if you're putting in subgrade, your subgrade's allowed to be 40 mils lower. So you're actually putting in more AP65. So just be aware of that. So it takes a lot of preparing some good DTMs, doing a lot of good ads builds. So you might have to do your, so you might have to report all your strings. So it's very important that you actually align do a fair day's work, you actually get paid for it. So if you've got more curb and channel than they've it's in the contract, you actually get paid for it. Areas, so you might have some garden areas, your asphalt matches up, your seal matches up. And as I said, there are slight differences between two initial values. This is just a little example of just some stockpiles. Just to, I just it was just more to give the students a bit of an example of the sort of quality that you that you would give. So we measured all these stockpiles. I think you can see that that's that one there, which will be one of these. Conversion factors are quite important. So this was trying to explain to the students was because you've got everyone wants to convert it into tons. So you've got some loose volumes out in the field. And then you'll want to convert it to tons. So that's that's um, so that is the conversion factors. And you have got all your tools to check them. You've got your little three D um, three D. You can exaggerate it, but just do a nice little plan like this. So it's really easy for everyone to um, be able to read it. Right, as built. Right. So now as built can be tricky because. I mean, on projects, so they're pursuant to the contract documents. So it's your role as a survey manager to read those documents, and make sure you know what the as built requirements are. You will, right. The easiest way, if you can get away with it, and you can discuss with the client, is to do a red line drawing. Now, a red line drawing will be um, something like all you do is grab some, some PDF software, sort of, and you will highlight on plans any differences from the plans that's your easiest get out of jail card free if you're doing as belts and your guys in the field should be doing that anyway your engineers to make sure that you know what's different when you do go and prepare they may ask a lot of times in new zealand for ram data that's um, some road asset management data um, and that sort of basically works off uh, it works off uh, like a chainage and an offset, and then you fill some attribute table in regarding that asset. It might be a full AutoCAD, a full AutoCAD write up like this. Now, this is a DCC little one they want. So they've given a specification what they require, and they require this in a full, full AutoCAD. So they've got all the lines. So this is something that, that we do. And then, so everything like this, the pipe types the grades, this is how they want it. And here is a road, is a roading one that, that we do. Now on here for our as built, we've got proof of all of our layers. So on here, you'll see all the layer differences, what they are, what they should be to prove that we meet the criteria for the project and we meet all the specifications. There's a lot of work. It may be a BIM requirement, so We've just started to get into that. That's a whole new field. It's quite, just did one down at the university. That's it's very interesting, but it's that's the way of the future. It may be GIS, so you may it may be Arc Info or something like that. So you may be out doing some say power poles, and the client may ask for a whole lot of table saying, "Oh, what's it made of?" 
what, how high is it? How many cross members has it got? What's the poll number? So, and it may be Pacific, local, whatever local counts. Now, what I'm going to say here, and I've been on projects where we've gone through the project. Someone may have read that. We've gone through and we actually haven't delivered on time for the as-built requirements. You know, some of the assets are buried below the ground. It just becomes a massive, you're always retrospectively going back and trying to prove what you've done. You might have to use a GPR. It's just a nightmare. So please read the contract documents and make sure that you do it correctly and make sure that you're doing it as you're as you're going along. Now, I'm going to give you another example of an as-built. It's quite important to actually do as-built as you are constructing the project. Now, there was a project recently where some infrastructure was put in. It was put in. It was wrong. No one did an as-built. And then there was some additional adjacent infrastructure put in that was correct. Now, that piece of infrastructure was built and it's now a big problem. Now, if someone had gone out there and that's going to cost a lot of money. If someone had gone out there and done some progressive as built, they would have said, hey, that's out. And the fix may have been thirty or $40,000 where the fix now, because things are constructed, may be a million dollars. So you've just got to, and the other thing here cost a lot of money. At the end of a project, what they can do is part of the cost to complete is as built. So they could be holding hundreds of thousands of dollars waiting for them as built. Very important. Right, so here's a little bit of an example of some BIM, just, just some BIM and some point clouds. Just So we're getting into that, I love it. So here's just a point cloud. We just flew a drone over it. And under here is our BIM model. BIM is great. You can look in it. You can crawl down it. It's, so this is just a manhole and some, and some sumps that it's, that it's going into. Now, this is really important for down the track when you can actually see all start. If you get some good BIM models, you'll see all your conflicts. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Right. What have I done? Sorry, that was me. Right. And the last slide I'm going to do is safety management. Now, I've left it to last, but normally on every project you do, the management, you must be able to manage your project, the safety aspect of it. Now, that everything and every major construction company I've worked for, that is probably the biggest KPI. So if you can't manage that side of it, it, it just has a, a, a massive implications on what, what you're doing in your career and, and what you're doing. You've got to be able to manage it. So part of the things you have to manage is you normally have to do a risk control plan for what you are undertaking. Now, we've got a number of survey risk control plans and they're all, and, they're, and here's an example of one working, working um, say, in a traffic control area. You must have an approved traffic management plan, work within a designated area, work set up to avoid reversing. So you can set your site up and site set up by trained staff, use cones and signage to alert public. So that is your typical traffic management. One of the other things, what I always think about safety is this is a good example I was told. If I want to go and measure a manhole in the middle of State Highway 1, and I just go out there and it's five o'clock at night and there's a whole lot of traffic. If I just go out there and just lift the lid and measure down, I'm probably going to die because someone's going to hit me. But if you put risk controls in that I'm going to go there at a certain time, have a traffic management plan, have everything in place, there is no risk. You've controlled your risk. Right, so that's... Now, when we're going about KPIs, quite often you will have... Here's an example for myself of leadership actions. So every month I'll have to do four leadership actions. 
So that's me discussing with people different aspects about safety, about quality, and I must write them up and I must present them and they're all, everyone looks at them. And if I don't do that, ramifications for me, if I just didn't do the safety, I would not get a bonus. My pay rise, my, I wouldn't get a pay rise more than likely. And you, quite often as a manager, you have to run pre-start meetings in the morning. So it's quite good just to discuss with the guys Right, guys, that's my whole pro. That's my presentation completed. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you so much, Craig. Um, this has been amazing. I'm just um, turning my, my video on. Um, that was just fantastic. It was really, really useful. Um, I've got lots and lots of notes, but um, I've learned a lot. Thank you. Um, but I do want to um, turn it over to the floor. If anyone has any kind of question at all um, for Craig, maybe you want to compare notes or um, or you're somebody who's just, yeah, just got something that you'd like to ask Craig. He's got so many years of experience. Is there anyone that has a question or something they'd like to put to Craig? Please feel free to unmute yourself and say hello. People are often shy at this at this um, stage, Craig. So um, I do have a question, uh, a couple of questions. Now, some of you know I'm not a server and I'm not an engineer, but I have learned a lot over the <laughs> certification assessment um, process that we've been through and just um, working for the last couple of years. I noticed something that we assess, obviously, you know, Craig, um, is in, a, in our geodetic section for a certified professional engineering server, we do um, assess people's knowledge of datums. And I noticed um, that you were actually pointing out under your risk control, control plan uh, survey screen, I think it was, um, that using an incorrect datum could cost you well on that particular example you were you were citing that it could cost uh, up up to fifty thousand dollars and I guess that depends on the size of of the job that you're doing but I found that fascinating um I just wanted to pick up on that and and point that out and note if you had any any comments on that obviously as a manager um what do you do to ensure that uh, the team or the person who you're managing is using the correct datum or do you find out later or um, is, is there anything you can comment on that because that's uh, a particular item as I think you would know having gone through <laughs> the geodetic um, assessment that we are really keen to make sure that people are all over um, conversions between vertical datums and also the transformations of, of geodetic coordinates. Yeah, one of the best text item. I've ever used an independent check. If I've got a GPS unit, I will set that up. It's not part of the datum. It's not part of the project. And I'll, then I'll go and check that on a benchmark for the project. And then I will go and check that against my set out. So that is independent of any total station set out or anything I've done. And that's maybe 25 mil accurate accuracy, but it'll tell me if I'm on the right datum and tell me if my setup was right. So it's a gross error check of about 20 to 25 mils, which will still give you a bad hair day if you're out by that much on some, but at least it tells you you haven't got any alarms, that, that it's a completely independent check. Someone recently told me that they got between the two datums, like 0.4 out, and only if they'd used the GPS, they would have um, picked up that 0.4 of a metre out. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, has anyone else uh, who's who's attending here on the screen today? Anybody um, got any comments on on this or any any further questions? Um, yes. Look, um, uh, Simon. Um, thank you very much for that. My name is Bruce Walker. I'm um, part of the, being part of the engineering surveying uh, pilot scheme and now an assessor, uh, but also chair of the technicians division. Just wanted to thank you uh, for your presentation. It's been very, very interesting. And um, I'm probably of your uh, generation, I'm 69, so I've been doing um, 
a lot of roading and earthworks uh, down through time from a, a, what was a cadastral background, um, as well as a lot of you know structural type works. But I found that really really interesting what you did there. It's almost um, <laughs> dare I say almost biblical what you what you put 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 out there, particularly in the age of post ministry of works, where a lot of these procedures that you've outlined there used to be standard large scale earth moving uh, type. Uh, requirements and techniques and specifications that were laid out there that had sort of not been around probably since around the mid 80s I guess and it was really neat to see that the way you've outlined those standard techniques there uh, Simon I don't know whether you came out of a Ministry of Works background yourself with that sort of um, amount of detail around how to um, analyse the review data, QA data setting out as built volumes etc. No, I did not come out of Ministry of Works background, but I did have a Ministry of Works um, survey manual when I left uni, which I carried around for many years. And I concur, the way they did it in those days was very good. They had the time, the money, and the effort to do that. Uh, working for a company like Felton Hogan, we can't get things wrong, so we must go through due diligence when we, when we operate. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, Simon, because... Um, you know, like you say, that's, and I mean, I, I, I have thoughts about that. I, I think the Ministry of Works played a massive role in setting standards for construction, but certainly construction surveying uh, back in the day. We don't have that now, and, and possibly there is a case for, um, you know, bringing it back maybe in the future. But certainly to see what you're doing with Fulton Hogan is really heartening, I think, for all of us who tend to be involved more on a casual basis with roading. You know, it, it can come and go in our careers and our businesses um, as a role that we have. But um, once again, just thank you. I, I hope I can get a copy of this, Jane, so that I can replay it to my younger people. Um, I, I think what you've laid out there, Simon, is is massive for, for, for all of us that have been in attendance today, that's for sure. Mm, that's great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. That's great, isn't it, Craig? I do want to point out, Craig has told me, um, he, he is Simon Craig, but he's been known as Craig all, all his life. So uh, <laughs> sorry oh, for, yeah. for the confusion. Um, if, just, if he's on an earth moving site, uh, Jane, he will have been called a number of things as well as his name, like we all have. You know? <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. A long time um, ago, yeah. yeah we, we, <laughs> they, we don't talk like that anymore anyway, not in Felton Hogan. No. Craig, something that I wanted to just pick up on uh, also, I've noted down a lot of things, uh, probably um, go on to a couple of other sessions, but I did note with quite um, a, a bit of interest that for every project, if I've heard correctly, for every project over 50,000, um, there is a, mis a risk matrix assessment done. Um, is that what you would call best practice? or obviously that's a, a Fulton Hogan um, standard, but do you have any comments about that um, in terms of the industry and obviously the other people on screen here and people listening to this recording, you know, for ye years to come uh, could be quite interesting. I just wanted to pick up on that point because I know you're very passionate about um, risk assessments and safety um, and QA, and I just uh, wondered if you had a comment on that. Yeah, I, I think so. I think it's like at Felton Hogan, it's kind of a safety, safety manual, which includes quality. So they, we have to do a risk assessment of all we're doing is building an item over that amount of money. So they need a risk assessment. So that was part, that's part of Felton Hogan. And I agree that something like that, you do need to look at it. You do need to look at what you're building over and just do a risk assessment. If I get the wrong date, and what's it going to cost me? If you don't do that, you you are going to have a you're going to have a you're going to have an error, and you're going to have a, a it's going to cost. Mm. Mm. That's really interesting. And the other thing I wanted to pick up on, and I don't know whether this is a valid question or not, so please uh, tell me. You you were talking about um, your use or Fulton Hogan's use of reflectorless versus pole, um, and I just wondered uh, you sort of mentioned that a little bit. Um, and I just wondered whether, again, whether that's uh, your particular preference or that's a Fulton Hoban preference or uh, any comments around that. It's just something I haven't heard uh, mean, much mention of and what I've been exposed to. Not, that was probably an industry preference because it's yeah. easier to set up. So you don't have to walk um, like 
say 200 meters there and back to get to three targets. It's just done straight away off. It's just done off. You can just set up and see them. So it just saves you probably 15 minutes per setup and it makes you very mobile because you can then just move say 10 meters and reset it, set yourself back up in five minutes. Mm. Yeah. There is a mm. bit tricky putting them in using least squares. You do have to be a little bit, you, to try and get the quality right, you do have to play around with some least squares adjustment because you can't actually set up over them to actually get them right. And the heights, you generally can't level to them. So yeah, but that is the preference in the industry. Just about every project I'm on uses that methodology. Yeah, that's interesting. So obviously that sort of dovetails into uh, my next comment, um, and that is around the use of least squares adjustment. I notice um, that obviously in the work that you do, it's a, a, that's a, a day-to-day method. We have had a number of comments um, in our assessment so far for the Certified Professional Engineering Survey that actually uh, the use of least squares adjustments in establishing new control networks is um, not an industry norm. Um, there seems to be um, a little bit of a pushback, I would say, uh, from, from some engineering surveys. Do you think there's a divide between um, large contractors and large um, commercial projects and what is what should be considered, you know, the professional industry norm with regards to um, the use of and knowledge of least squares as opposed to perhaps um, smaller one-man bands or smaller um, smaller businesses, say, focusing on residential work? I think it's a, an, an important um, thing to hear you comment on given your um your multiple use of um, least squares and and the content of your presentation. You learn it at university, where I learnt it. You don't use it all the time. I use it all the time because I know it's it's got it gives me redundancy. It gives me a really nice error analysis, and it gives me an error ellipse and some proof of what I've, what I've done to a 95% confidence limit. So once you get into it, it's really easy to use. But if you haven't been using it, it is quite scary. And what I've found is probably only 20% of surveyors actually use it confidently all the time. And I've always used it, but I think it should be the norm because it does give you that redundant. It does give you those nice error ellipses and it gives you a statistical analysis of how well you've how well your control is. So I suggest we do, but I can understand why people don't. If you do a bowdage adjustment, it's just not, it's not the same. It, yeah. So that's my opinion. We should be using it and it just takes a bit of education. It's not that scary. Thank you. Um, so for people who are going to be listening in, because we're going to put this on our CPD library. So for people who are are listening in in the future, um, just to, to push a little bit more um, on that, if if I'm sitting listening in and I've, uh, you know, had a whole engineering surveying career using Bowditch, I've never really had to use least squares, I'm sitting here thinking, yeah, but I can get away without it, but now I have to uh, because I am going to go for the certification. Um, can you just go into a little bit more detail for someone who's a bit least squares um, you know, a bit of a least squares novice um, as to what the advantages are. You've alluded to some of them, but but just sort of, you know, side by side, why would you use least squares versus Bowditch in a certain situation or, or um, you know, why would you push for it to be the industry norm? Adjusts out an error. Sorry, Craig, I've lost you there. Uh, over length of the Travis it's actually, sorry, sorry, Craig, can you it, just start is, that? Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah, it was just when you moved, we couldn't hear you. Yeah. It's, it, it doesn't actually adjust it. It adjusts it as a mathematically, but it doesn't actually adjust it. So if you've got a line, say, a kilometre long, and you've got a whole lot of stations, it'll adjust it according to the length of the line. So it's not really a mathematical. It may, the error may not be in that line, be in that section. So it may just be in one section of that of that one kilometre and you're not going to pick it up. Where if you use least squares and you, you're, you're using redundant observations, you're using more than one 
observation to give you a coordinate or a height, you might be using three. So that's where you have the redundancy and you can prove where your error is. Now, one of the other tricks if someone's young is learning how to do least squares, one of the tricks I learned was don't chuck it all in one big adjustment. The way I do it is I just put one adjustment, one line in at a time. I'll type it in or I'll put it in. Then I just run the adjustment and keep running it. And if there is some error, I'll find it straight away. But if you put, if you've got multiple errors in your data and you go to put that in, you're going to have, you could, it's very hard to find out. It's very hard to locate where that error is. That's so just, it's Jane, it's just a redundancy and proving that your point that you're set up on is within five mils by two mils at a 95% confidence limit. When you run a bowdage, you cannot prove that. Sounds like a pretty solid case to me, Craig. Um, just in the last couple of minutes uh, before we close off, does anyone have any comment on, on what Craig has uh, answered in these uh, answers um, to date or anything that you'd like to ask as a result just now? Wow, I've got the floor, Craig. Isn't it amazing? Yeah. <laughs> Here we go. Um, I've got a, I've got a final one uh, that I was just um picking up on, and uh, I don't know whether it's it's just something that you can quickly comment on. You were mentioning uh, in your section on your GPS uh, setup, radio or internet was, um, and I found that kind of interesting. Was that uh talking about uh, being a conscious choice to use radio or internet or uh, use radio in the absence of internet? Because obviously we've got some pretty remote areas in New Zealand where it wouldn't be possible um, to use internet. And I know that um, we have quite a few conversations going around in our assessments when, um, for example, uh, the lens converter cannot be used or can't be reached or, you know, you just, you just can't get on online. So I don't know if you've just got any comments on 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 that. So you would use radio. Radio has its problems. It, it's it's probably accurate to maybe it's just got transmission problems. You might have to set some repeaters up. But certainly in the case where you've got no internet, you've got no choice. So you would use a radio. A radio may be more cost effective on a project because you might have 20 or 30 pieces of plant and they're all got a radio. So that might, instead of having an internet, and if your internet goes down, we had that discussion today on site, we're setting up a project. What was the best? So I said to them, probably prefer the internet, but we'll have everything set up for the radio. So if something does, it gives you that redundant. So if your radio goes down, it does give you that redundant option to get your corrections. But you are quite right, Jane, on some places, you've got no choice but to use the radio. That, that's just, that's the way it is. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, thank you. And finally, I was really interested in your uh, example um, that you put on the screen about the use of red line drawings with clients, um, noting what's different in the plan. I thought that was really smart. Is that something that um, is an industry norm that people on the screen or people watching this recording would be familiar with? Or um, is that something that uh, maybe we could pick your brains about further? Pretty much industry standard. You should do, a, it's a really, cheap way or just a really easy way of getting some as-builts done so if you can mm. pinch that if you can pitch that at the start of the project it just makes it easy because you should be doing red line drawings anyway jane because you need to highlight what is actually not correct to the plans there's some really neat sort of software out there that you can actually put some comments put all your comments on you can actually hyperlink in there a notice to the engineer and it will say it, it's just, you have to do these red lines anyway, but if you can get away with just doing that and it's basically been built to the plans, that's a really easy way of getting your as built completed. Mm. Thank you. And finally, I do want to say thank you for the presentation today, but I'm, I'm really uh, probably going to pick your brains later on the example that you gave of that um, 
project that wasn't as built during the project and then you've ended up with this um yeah really bad scenario uh, and it's a very good point uh in case um to as built during the project as you go along is do you think that there is a there are budget um constraints or that's a client wanting to cut corners or what why would why would that happen because obviously that's not good practice from an engineering surveying point of view uh, that potentially happened because there was a subcontractor surveyor pulled in to do that component of the job and it wasn't the engineer didn't do due diligence and requesting that where that's the first thing I do is go and as built it and make sure it's correct and if we have to make any adjustments we've got then the option of rip it out which we wouldn't want to do if it's out then we can maybe come back and adjust the other component to make it fit and go to the client but we would go there with the option of what we think the best scenario was yeah but i think in the industry at the moment i think due diligence is not often followed mm. it's more than it, sh it should be mm. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Craig. Um, I have a list of things here. I really think uh, it would be fantastic perhaps to look at a, um, a Craig Canelli um, follow-up, um, particularly around um, Q&A and due diligence and safety. Um, I think that that could be really good. I can see that you're just a wealth of knowledge and really, really appreciative of you coming on and doing this session and being part of our engineering surveying assessor team. And um, congratulations also on becoming a certified professional engineering surveyor. And we look forward to, um, forward to the future. So thanks everyone for attending. And thank you to all of you who uh, were not able to attend live, but I know we're listening into the recording. This will go up on our CPD library. Um, watch out for more. So thank you for, very much for coming today and goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.